Hello everyone and welcome to our latest tutorial on the language investigation. This time we're in the lesson 7, the analysis section. This is the biggest part of your investigation and will take about 60% of your overall word count. So we need to know how to do it right. Right, analysis. That's the four things I'm going to focus on today is what is analysis? We're going to look at linguistic selection and how do you choose? going to look at how you actually open sections of your analysis, how do you write it, and then we're going to look at how you pick up the marks for it. Right, what is analysis? Well, analysis means doing the following things. Knowing your data really well and looking at it to see what linguistic patterns are emerging. I couldn't possibly do this as a general tutorial for you and be specific to help you. You've got to know your data inside out. So you've got to be able to be aware if the most important thing are certain sentence types, or is it the use of modal verbs, or is it the use of abstract nouns? Perhaps it's the use of synonymous antithetic parallelism. Look at your data, what's really prominent, what's jumping out to you. Then you want to think, why are those things being used? Why are those speakers voluntarily or involuntarily? It could be a deliberate choice or a subconscious choice why are they using those features of language? And then, how does this subvert, support or subvert existing theory? If you're doing gender one, we're looking at existing gender theory. If it's a power one, you might be bringing in some of your occupation theories, and so on and so on. In many cases, you may be looking at your own independently researched theory. For example, if you're doing language and comedy, you might have a book on language and comedy, which could help you with this. But is what, do your findings sub support or subvert what the theorists say? Okay, linguistic selection. This is the single most important thing you need to do. And you really need to get to know your data extremely well in order to decide what are the most pertinent aspects for your selection. I've said, I've listed some things before. Is it sentence types? Is it clause types, phrase types? Is it modal verbs? Is it dynamic verbs? Is it the use of abstract nouns? Now, you need to be looking at and saying, well, what is emerging in my language? If it's phonological, do you need to use the IPA for it? Now, do the most prominent features match with what you said in your methodology? If not, that's not a problem because you can always add to your methodology. You can always change your methodology. Now, some people do end up writing their methodology once they've finished their investigation, their final methodology anyway, and that is acceptable. Third one, start getting statistical evidence for each linguistic choice. Let's say you're looking at the ratio of epistemic to deontic modal verbs in the two texts, or in a text. You're going to start tallying them up. Speaker A uses 17 deontic modal verbs and only five epistemic modal verbs, whereas speaker B and so on. What you need to do, you need to have really well put together numerical work. So tally charts are needed. Tables are needed. However you want to organise it for collecting it is entirely up to you. I'll show you soon what you actually do with it once you've selected it. So you've chosen your most important things. It matches up with your methodology of changing methodology. You've got all your totals done. What do you do next? This is how you start to write it. And this is how you open a section of analysis. You should start with the title. And it's often best if you phrase this as a question. Then we have an opening sentence to introduce it. Then you quantitatively display your findings. You display them in a graph form or a table form, pie chart form. Then you have a summary sentence to say what the graph shows. Then what's really effective, number five is optional, but I find this really useful if people are doing word level analysis or even phrase level analysis, a table of quotations. Now your graph and your quotations do not count in your word count, so don't worry about having a huge table of quotations. It's fine. This is what it will look like in practice, and this is from one of this year's cohort. You've seen her introduction and the methodology before. It's about the change in language of women's rights protests, and she began with this. There you can see here, analysis. This is the opening to her analysis, and she phrases it as a question. The first part of her analysis is this. How are nouns and semantics used in feminist campaigns to achieve their goals? Then she has a really clear pie chart 
of the concrete nouns versus abstract nouns in the first wave of feminism, and then a, a one a second pie chart showing the opposite in the third and fourth waves of feminism. If you're sitting there thinking, why should she got the second wave? Well, she explained that in a methodology. Beneath that, she has a graph to show. The next thing that was on, and this wasn't side by side, it was beneath, but I've just screenshot it and then put it in here, is a table of quotations which really enables her to then be analytical. So you're going to open with the title analysis. Then you're going to have maybe two, three or four sections of analysis. And this is her section it's on nouns and the semantics behind the nouns. So you then have your subheading phrase as a question. You have your graph, explanation of the graph, and a table of quotes. There's something missing. And if we just move on, we'll see. She doesn't really have an opening sentence, does she? A title and then an opening sentence. I would like to know why she's doing that. So a very short sentence saying what, what she's looking for here. That would be even better. OK. So. Picking up the marks, then, we're going back to our assessment objectives. What linguistic patterns are emerging? You're looking at language features, linguistic choices. Why are they being used? Think deeply about the context and the representations. Context, we're always thinking genre, audience, purpose. And representations are in there, too. And how does this support or subvert existing theory? Right. Let's remind ourselves of the one we've just looked at, this one here. Pause it if you need to. OK, I'm now going to ask you to read this and this. This is all of her writing following up on these, these tables. So she's produced these tables and this is two slides worth of analysis. I'll hold this slide on for about 10 seconds and then skip to the next one. But of course, you can pause to read it at your own pace. OK. Pause if you need to, then press play when you're done. OK, how was she doing then? Well, firstly, it's impressive in the way it's written. It's a very well written piece with them, um, which explains things extremely well. She uses her data extremely well, too. The use of percentages is very convincing. She is superb when writing about context. You know, she puts it very strongly at the end of the paragraphs contextually. This is also interesting. That's a follow up piece of context. She's very good here in the context of feminism. She's really good at summing up things about what the trend shows. So to go to the assessment objectives, she's very strong on AO3. Now, if there's one you want to be strong on, it is AO3, isn't it? Because it's, that, it's got worth the most marks. It's worth 20 of your 50 marks. How's she doing an AO1? Well, on the first page, I'm seeing nouns, concrete nouns, abstract nouns, semantic fields. And it's fine, isn't it? Because it's all correct, but it's not incredibly impressive. She gets better on the second page. She brings things in such as she looks at the relationship between the noun and the adverb of quantity, between the noun and the collective pronoun. So she starts to look at relationships between language, which means she's able to move up AO1. Now, she's outstanding at guiding the reader. So she's clearly at the top band of that. For terminology, is she up there yet? No, but she gets better in her later sections of analysis. So I think she probably will end up in here. What about theoretical stuff? Go back and have a look. There's not much, is there? So she really has an understanding of her data. She's prepared. She had a very evaluative methodology. She's really exploring her data, so that's good. But there isn't really any theory in here. Now, she struggled with this because it was a gender-based investigation. She was um, focusing on language and gender. And you'll probably remember that nearly all language and gender research is based on spoken language rather than written language. Well, she's exploring written language. So we had left this 
at the state where she was still going to be looking and tweaking. She had some things later in an investigation. She was still in the process of revision. That was when the school shut lockdown happened. We were hoping to add a bit more in here. We didn't get there. Now, I can share with you people who have been able to do those, uh, but I want to share this one because I think it explains things really well. What she needed to be able to do is to say something like, let's look at here. She could have said, the abstract nature of the language is supported by the theories of X, who says that. And if she does that, she's going to be fine on AO2 as well. So that was a relative weakness of our work. So a reminder, you're marked for AO1, your terminology and how well you guide the reader. AO2, theories. AO3, contexts. We're talking genre, audience, purpose and representations. Where do you go next? Right, seven stages. Number one, understand your data. You now know your data, but do you really understand it very well? That's the next thing you need to do. It, alongside stage one, you need to be doing stage two because it will help you understand your data. Start quantifying it. You might think one thing is really important. Start quantifying it. You think well, there's actually nothing to support this. Stage three, have your theory, the relevant theories you want to use. Know that. Stage four, when you start to write, follow your methodology, but feel free to adapt your methodology if needs be. Section five, write this in sections. Don't try and write one essay. This is not an essay. And if you hand it in to us and say, I've written this as an essay, well, we'll send it back to you and say, we didn't want it as an essay. It is not an essay. It's an investigation. Write it as sections. I've told you how to organize your sections before, here as well. That's how to start it. You start it with this, with your quantitative data, and then you move into the analysis of it, the comments on it. You probably get about three sections of analysis in here. Most people do. You might have four. You might have two. If you need IPA support, we can offer that because I have a copy of Harry Cook's investigation from this year. Plus, he is on standby to support anyone up until the end of the summer holidays as well. So if you think you're going to want IPA support, and I've got two people who have been in contact with him, then feel free to get in touch with me and I'll ask him if he's happy to help you with that because he is a genius. Last thing, really explore your data. You've chosen this topic because you're interested in it. So really explore it and have fun doing it. OK, this is the most challenging part of your investigation, really preparing for your analysis. We'll give you plenty of time to do it. Please use your teachers and support as well. And then get going with it. Right, that's everything from me. This will be the last one of these until we move on to actually writing a conclusion. next, And that will probably be next term. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.